wherever you go in Africa, at every kilometer, you're going to find a church. Churches are everywhere. You cannot count them and finish. And I think these churches, I mean, Africa is the most church laden land. I mean, the churches you find here, you won't find in Europe, you won't find in America. We have so, so many churches. And some of these churches are really, really very big, magnificent churches that were built with so much money, money that was not donated by anyone. These churches have been built by people, communities, pulling their resources together and putting the first brick until the church was finished. So thinking about this tells me that actually our communities are able, they have the capacity with the numbers that we have. If we pull our resources together and work together, we can fix hospitals. Education Monday, Education Monday, on the Tribal Root Studio with Alina Zahil. Changing mindsets in Africa, making a world better. Together, we can make a difference. We are fixing Africa. Education Monday, Education Monday. Greetings everyone. This is Alina Zahir once again on the Trouble Studio. Welcome back into the new year. It's been such a long time I haven't spoken to you and I'm so happy to be speaking to you once again. So 2024 has been such a great year for me and one of the highlights of this new year is the birth of my son. He was born on the 16th November in such great health and we are so thrilled to have him. Um, right there he is. African people worldwide and all the people worldwide, we really, really love you. So let's talk about something that's really, really important in our societies, our children in the society and how we put so much burden on their lives. We come from societies whereby children have to grow up and take care of the whole clan, take care of their children, take care of the siblings. Um, when a child, an African child is growing up, we tend to tell these children and we tend to pressure them to show them that they have responsibilities to take care of their young. Basically, we are turning these little children into adults. We are making them parents when they are children themselves. We are putting a lot of pressure onto these children. It is only in Africa where children have to grow up thinking about building a home for their parents, taking care of their sick parents, paying school fees for their brothers and sisters. Unlike in the Western civilizations, whereby the parents have to pass some things to their children in form of wealth, what we call generational wealth. So this is why I say most times that we really have to break the curse. We have to break the curse and remember that we should have something that our children will inherit, something that we will pass on to the generations to come, maybe to even the third generation. Think about a society that only thinks about today. This is the African society. That's why we have so many people in the governments, in societies, in the organizations that are so corrupt. Because all they think about is themselves. They're not thinking about their children. They're not thinking about their children's children and their children's children's children. Because that's what makes you human, to be thinking about future generations. And in the same way, that's why we talk about uh, environmental degradation. How you see people destroying the forests, destroying the swamps, destroying the lakes and the water bodies, just because they think about themselves only. They think life stops at their generation. We have to think more about the generations to come to qualify as people who should be respected by the rest of the nations. And talking about this, let's also talk about mental health. When we put all this pressure on our young children and we want them to fix all the things that we failed to fix, we are sending them into mental crisis. And this is a problem. We have a lot of people who are mentally affected and people who are mentally affected are people who are unproductive. To have a productive society, you have to have mentally stable people. We come from generations of slavery, colonialism, strife and wars and conflict. And because of this, we have a lot of people who are mentally 
disabled. We have people who are mentally challenged. And because of this, it's so hard for our society to govern ourselves. It's so hard for us to make the right decisions because we are all sick and we all need help. So it's important that the policies that are in all of African leadership put mental health in the center of everything. If you're going to have people in the parliament that are mentally upright, that are going to make the right decisions for the people, they got to be people who are mentally stable. And this is why I work for this organization, Telemed, and we are promoting mental health in areas where people are marginalized or in areas like the refugee camps where you have a lot of people who are coming from war-torn areas and who have a lot they have dealt with mentally and we are asking the governments and the, the, the funding organizations why can't you fund such an organization? Why can't you give your support to an organization like this? And why can't this kind of program be uh, spread all over the nation or spread all over Africa so that we care enough to know that the people that are going to build the nation are people who are mentally upright. Do you ever imagine what could happen if you have a president or you have members of parliament or you have executive directors who are mentally ill, who are going to make deadly decisions, who are going to even physically fight in office, who cannot process the problems that we have in this in the nation or who can even not make the proper decisions or for the solutions that are needed for our people so when we talk about mental health a lot of people are thinking about people who have already like a long gone they're in the streets maybe they are naked and they are jumping up and down and maybe they're sleeping in the trenches that's not it mental health actually is about all of us and we are all victims of mental health and we need to care enough, we need to pay attention enough, and we need to give it all our resources to make sure we are right. That's the only way we shall achieve stable families, the very good working organizations, and good working environments, good leadership, good governance. That's how we shall uh, be able to achieve all of that. So mental health actually goes so far to the little things that you do and the little things that you cannot do. If you cannot properly manage your anger, you are a victim of mental health. If you, you are very violent or if you, you cannot resolve conflicts in the most calm way, you are sick. You need help. So when we talk about mental health, we are saying really that every one of us is a candidate of mental health and we all need to care enough to make sure we can fix our mental health communities. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm also going to talk about uh, a lot of problems that we have in Africa definitely and a lot of ways that people are trying to fix these problems and the most I think the most popular way people are trying to fix the African problem is immigrating. Lots of you are thinking about leaving the nation. I, I must go abroad and get a new life like greener pasture. That's what everyone is thinking about and every time I think about it I'm like who actually is thinking about fixing Africa? Who is thinking about fixing my community? Who is thinking about when I grow up, when I have enough money, I'm going to build a hospital here. When I, I become able, I'm going to build a road. Who, how many of our young people are thinking about that? So this is a very, very big problem. So recently, we have this uh, lady, Robin Kisti. She has been explaining her life, living abroad, her decision to return, and actually she returned to Uganda and returned with her kids and she explains with lots of reasons why she thinks living in Uganda is the best or living in Uganda is better than living in America. Take a listen. Because w work takes over everything because it is the key of living abroad. Love will because it takes patience, it takes understanding. Let's say, for example, if you have a child, 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 you have so I think you have listened and you have heard her. She is not crazy. 
she, she is in her right mind and I think she's a very dignified person and this is the kind of mindset I think most of our youth need to be taught about. We need to teach dignity. I just even sometimes wish dignity was taught as a virtue in school whereby you know that you cannot move from your nation to go and be a slave in another nation. We cannot condemn slavery that happened in that, to Africa when we are still fueling slavery with our own bodies, with our own minds. We are giving in ourselves, we are offering ourselves to be enslaved. So you have most of these people explaining and telling you when you get abroad, you have to settle for the least of the jobs. You have to work in the worst of the conditions. You have to work on pressure. You do not have enough time for family. Your children have to be in daycare. You're not living a life full of love and life. You're actually subjected to the worst treatment sometimes, especially those who go to the Middle East. But then we have our, most of our people choosing that over fixing our nations. Where is our responsibility? Where is the love for our nations? And wh what are the virtues of our lives? What is our purpose to life we are, if we're not living to fix our communities, to create things that have not been there, to build from scratch, but build castles for ourselves. That's what I think about all the time. Oh, how many people are living abroad and their dream is when I work, when I have made enough money, I'll return home and build. So few of them are thinking like that. Many of them want to die there because they think they have escaped they have escaped the troubles at home, they have escaped the struggles, and no one is thinking about fixing our community. So we have had about a lot of problems with immigration. We had Trump when he was still the president, and he used to talk about the, the immigra immigrants in making America fast and taking America, I mean, say, he used to say America fast, and then a lot of people used to hate him for that. But I think for me, he was in his right mind, and I think that's what every rational person should be thinking. Before you can think about fixing people's families, you should look at your own family. You should fix your own house. You should make sure before you can think about changing a community, you have to change the small family where you're from. I think that's the beginning. And I think this was the school of thought for Trump. And a lot of people misunderstood him. And I don't think it was right that so many people misunderstood him when what he was actually implying was he needed to care for America first before other nations. And for us as Africans, we actually saw a lot of sense in that because he even talked about we, we don't have to be out there fighting these useless wars. And for Africans, it's like a fresh breath because we're like, if he doesn't want to be creating wars and fighting wars, it means the other nations are safe as well. Because most of the wars that we know as we know them are created by the people that love war, that the, the, the people who are bloodthirst. We don't even actually understand. For example, the situation in the Congo, the war that has been ongoing for such a long time, decades of war, and no one is asking who is in the Congo. Which Western nations are in the Congo? Who is paying the money? Where is the money coming from? Where are the, the, the fighting weapons coming from? Who is building and fueling all these rebel groups? So, uh, thinking about going abroad, it's not a bad idea. It's good that people can expand their knowledge and their impact and then share the experience. But I think that it does not make us a respectable people and a dignified people if we choose abroad over our communities or if we decide to discard our communities in pursuit for a better life abroad when our people are perishing in our communities. There's just one example I'm going to give <clears throat> that I've seen this everywhere I've gone. Wherever you go in Africa, at every kilometer, you're going to find a church. Churches are everywhere. You cannot count them and finish. And I think these churches, I mean, Africa is the most church-laden land. I mean, the churches you find here, you won't find in Europe, you won't find in America. We have so, so many churches. And some of these churches are really, really very big, magnificent churches that were built with so much money, money that was not donated by anyone. These 
churches have been built by people, communities, pulling their resources together and putting the first brick until the church was finished. So thinking about this tells me that actually our communities are able, they have the capacity with the numbers that we have. If we pull our resources together and work together, we can fix hospitals, we can fix schools, we can fix factories, we can do just anything. We would not be even sitting there waiting on the government or complaining to anyone or even begging. Just, just the same way that we built the churches. My village has the best church. I mean, they have put a foundation for a church that I haven't seen in the whole of Western Uganda. And I think for that reason, I have every reason to believe that we have to think about our priorities. We have to evaluate our lives our societies and then think about fixing ourselves and being proud of knowing that east west home is best so the best place is home and the best place to invest is home put your money where your mouth is and that is home women yes so i was looking at our society and i was looking at our our young women in the cities and how you see all these university students and those who have just finished university in they are all over the place and they are the cream they are the hope they are the strength of, of the society and they are the people that we look up to i want you to look at this now, when you have women that have all their focus on how their bodies look or who is looking at them or how they are impressing the society or how they are trying to, uh, they, they are, they're probably trying to attract the male species in the society, or they are also trying to seduce, they are trying to seduce the people. Uh, one of the teachers in the American history is called Messenger Elijah Muhammad. He talked about no nation can rise higher than its woman. Think about a nation where the most energetic women of that nation girls talking on TikTok or they are busy trying to attract the people uh, for sexual benefits or they are trying to prostitute call it prostitution because this is what we see in our society today when we do not have women that are being trained in child upbringing they are not being trained in cooking they are not being trained in, in, in making proper meals that are beneficial for the good health of the children. Uh, women are not think, thinking about cleanliness, cleaning our societies. It is in Africa that we have all these unclean places in the villages and in the towns, in the slums. And the same people are asking the government to come and fix our societies. They are asking the government to come and clean up or you find your, you're tasking your mayor to clean up. The people are supposed to clean up other people that live in those societies. And we have to make sure that these people are really onto that. They have to do it themselves because no one is going to do that for us. Or you're not employing anyone to pay them. You can't even afford to pay them. So you have to clean your backyard. You have to clean everywhere you live for good health. So think about the society that has women that are doing that. That are taking maybe on weekends, taking their children, taking their, their teenagers to clean clean their surroundings to clean their environment but all we have is what women twerking twerking on tiktok trying to get views for showing their booties trying to get views for showing their bleached bodies bleached skin and that is a society that is going into regression so we are actually under a very big big mental crisis where we cannot articulate and know what our problems are know how to fix our problems and somehow we tend to think there's someone that's going to come or maybe fall from heaven and save us from ourselves all we need is to go back and look at ourselves reevaluate and make sure we fix our communities uh, recently there's something that's been going on in my mind and it's about uh, how we lose our people all of us have lost someone we have had to be uh, called that someone has died in a family or a family friend or an important person in the society and usually I've seen some of these uh, funerals where we have the burial ceremonies uh, you find like a southern people going to bury more than a southern and the whole village gathering and this is something that's been happening for such 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 a long time I think since I was born so you have a relative 
that just lost a member of the family. And when people go there to bury, on the day they go to bury, they, they, they vandalize and they destroy everything. You find the banana plantation has all been cut down. Every food that they had in the garden has been taken uh, by the people. People are eating in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. And you have people who are making funny comments. I don't understand why people make such comments. Someone says, this burial is the best I've attended. How can on earth a burial be the best? How can someone lose their person and they are grieving and they are crying? And then there is someone saying this is the best. How can it be the best? How are you even thinking, being happy or trying to make comments like that that show that this, is, has, this has become some kind of a trend where people are enjoying burying their people? I mean, this is a time for grieving. And I was talking to the elders in my community and they told me that normally when people died in the past, people used to fear death. People used to fear a place where someone has died. People used to fear to be in the presence of a dead person. So people, whenever they would lose a person, the family people, about three families, the relatives, they would bury their dead. Other people would mourn from their places and actually people would even fear to pass in that area where someone has been just buried but we have come to a point where people come to a place that has lost a member and they are jubilating and they are dancing and they are making funny comments and then we also have these people who make speeches like they call a member of parliament or they call an LC1 chairman, LC2 chairman and they are trying to make a speech like eulogize the dead and all they do is comedy. They will speak about things that will make people laugh. It doesn't matter how much you can make people laugh, you can make people laugh on a burial ceremony. The people that lost their member are never going to laugh because they are grieving. They are not happy. How can you be there trying to make people laugh? It doesn't make sense to me at all. Anyway. I hope that people can learn that when I lose someone, really I'm paining, I'm grieving, and probably I'm spending. And I do not need to have people around me that are trying to make fun of the day, make fun of the dead, and even trying to make it like maybe an outing. They have been out and they are trying to have a good day. Doesn't make sense to me. Uh, then, uh, in addition to this, we have also seen people that love the dead. Yes, we have people that love the dead. We come from communities where a dead person attracts the people that never visited you, people that never stepped in your compound, people that never gave you a call. They are the people that run to your home to bury you. And when they come to your home, they actually spend. We have had people that are struggling with family members who are sick. You find that there's a family member who is sick and then this person is really, really sick and they need financial help and the family has exhausted all their money to the point that they now know that their person is going to die. But what people usually do is they will listen to those stories. They'll even see you uh, taking loans or they see you selling most of your properties trying to treat a sick person in your family and they will do nothing about it. They will not even make any suggestions of let's contribute money for you. But the moment someone calls them and says, this person has died, people will even travel by air. They will come to bury that person. They will spend so much money coming to bury that person. They will dress well, they will drive cars, they will have enough fuel, and they will buy food, they will, they will, they will slaughter animals to buy everything they need. They will even buy liquor to bury you. Just imagine a society like that. A very, very, very backward society where people celebrate and have enough money to bury people, but they do not have enough money to fix people. Think about it. We are also going to talk about something very important in a society. I was talking to a friend recently and he had just made uh, a research he was doing a country research and he said he moved all over Uganda in the different corners western northern uh, northern southern 
and Eastern and I said it's amazing how much work that the women are doing. It's amazing how many women are into entrepreneurship. It's amazing how many women are seated in the markets. It's amazing how many women are entrepreneurial and they are doing their best. Thank you for joining the community. Thank you for watching. Remember to subscribe, like and share. Together we can make a difference.